Well, thanks so much to everybody for coming and Jennifer and Tamara and others for hosting. It's it's really been a, a tremendous pleasure. I enjoyed the morning discussion very, very much. Um, so history is uh, essential, actually, to understanding U.S. insider trading law, the law that's on the books today. Um, but history is also essential to understanding how and we can move the law and shape the law continuing into the future. And so this seems like a wonderful time to share some of my thoughts um, on where we could go um, in the future based on history. Um, so my plan is to speak and uh, discuss a little bit about how U.S. courts, uh, particularly the U.S. Supreme Court, created an insider trading prohibition through their interpretation of a broad anti-fraud rule in the United States, that's SEC Rule 10b-5, um, that was promulgated in the 1940s um, under authority through a congressional statute uh, dating back to 1934. So in the United States, uh, to be found liable or guilty because insider trading can be prosecuted either civilly or criminally, um, you, uh, it, you, it's essential that there be some type of a provable fraud. Um, and so that is very different uh, than the law in Australia and the law in New Zealand and the law in UK and the law in just about every other jurisdiction with a developed securities market where there is an express statutory provision uh, prohibiting the purchase or sale of securities on the basis of material non-public information. In the United States, if it's not fraud, it's not illegal insider trading, with just a few exceptions that I don't have time to go into. So um, to prove fraud, then, fraud needs to involve a, um, well, a lie. But insider trading is not about telling lies. In fact, it's about keeping secrets or about staying silent about other people's secrets. And so it latches on to the common law idea of a fraudulent non-disclosure. Um, when is pure silence deemable to be a fraud? So prior to the federal securities laws in the United States, as a matter of common law, there was some recognition of what we could think about as insider trading, purchasing stock on the basis or selling stock on the basis of material non-public information. But those were always in face-to-face -face securities transactions where a director new information about a company, uh, an officer who knew information about a company, um, essentially misled the shareholder by remaining silent. But that wasn't even, and here's where history becomes important, that wasn't even the majority rule at common law. Um, as, as Susan's work this morning told us that the majority rule at common law was generally that Directors and officers do not owe fiduciary duties um, to shareholders directly. They owe it to the corporation. And in a private securities transaction, the majority rule at common law was there was no triggering duty of disclosure. Um, a minority of jurisdictions, and here we're talking in the early 1900s in the United States, a, majority, a minority of jurisdictions, a few states, did recognize, um, and I guess that can go under the category of legal fiction, that we're going to say that the director owed a fiduciary duty to the shareholder to disclose facts about the transaction. Um, so that's where the U.S. was basically until, so Rule 10b-5 comes in um, the in 1940s. There were a few cases, again, face-to-face -face transactions um, where extrapolating from this minority rule at common law was found to be a fraud. Um, but the watershed events really occurred in the 1960s and 1970s when lower federal courts and the Securities and Exchange Commission broadly interpreted Rule 10b-5, went with the minority rule at common law, and said that there is a disclosure duty um, when insiders are trading. Now, then, as courts often do, extrapolated from that. And basically, by 1968, the Second Circuit was saying in a very famous case, Texas Gulf Sulphur, in, uh, involving secret information about an ore strike, um, that 
Um, anyone in possession of material non-public information must either disclose that information or abstain from trading, hence the sort of disclose or abstain rule, which would have taken the United States fairly close to the statutory prohibition in Australia, New Zealand, the EU, et cetera. Um, so 1980, um, a case involving a financial printer um, who uh, was printing secret tender offer documents. Um, he deciphers the codes. Um, he is found guilty. It was the first criminal insider trading case of insider trading for violating Rule 10b-5. He appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court actually reverses the conviction. Um, what the Supreme Court, Justice Powell wrote the opinion, what the Supreme Court said is, well, no, under common law, the rule is caveat enter. Uh, let the buyer or seller beware. And um, uh, the triggering duty for um, disclosure that would render that silence a fraud um, must come from a common law duty. And Justice Powell said, and under the common law, it's only insiders uh, of a corporation that have that duty to disclose. Well, several problems with that. One, it's a historical, and that wasn't even the rule of common law. But B, there were actually a number of different common law exceptions, including a duty of good faith, sometimes going back to some of the work done earlier there. The exception in the common law that my work has focused on um, is actually a British common law case from um, the 1800s, uh, Phyllis versus Humphrey. Um, which said that there is a duty to disclose when one wrongfully acquires information. Um, and that case involved uh, not stock trading at all, but real property. And it was a case involving trespass. And um, the uh, person looking to acquire the property illegally entered land, did some mineral testing, found the mineral that the land was more valuable um, and therefore um, underbid for the price. And of course, when the owner of the land learned that there was a trespass there, brought the suit, sought revision, and indeed uh, uh, rescission, and indeed received that. Um, on the theory that the informational asymmetry was wrongfully acquired. It was only through the act of trespass that put the buyer of this land in a privileged position with respect to information. And while the general rule is one of caveat emptor, not so when you wrongfully acquire information. Um, and so what, um, so Justice Powell though, ignored all of that. And in fact, the Supreme Court briefs um, included a citation to Philip versus Humphrey. The Department of Justice was trying to recognize that while fiduciary duty is one of the triggers of an affirmative duty to disclose, um, it is not the only trigger. Um, so I'll get back to sort of where I see in current law the relevance of this, but um, 15 minutes goes quickly, and I wanted to make sure that I got out my Philip versus Humphrey um, um, ode to there. So let me talk more then about the development of um, our classical theory of insider trading and our misappropriation theory of insider trading. Um, the 1980 case of Chiarella versus United States is a so-called classical theory case because the fiduciary relationship there runs between the buyer of the securities and the shareholder on the other side of the transaction or the seller of securities and the, and the uh, shareholder on the other side of the transaction. Um, there, then, what we are talking about when we're talking about insider trading liability is typically officers, directors, more legal fiction here, um, employees. Um, actually, there's case law that says the corporation itself owes a duty of disclosure when shareholders are on the other side of the transaction there. Um, a, little, a little strange. Um, uh, so that was 1980. Um, there were massive holes then if all we could prohibit 
um, was the buying or selling of securities on the basis of material non-public information by insiders of a company, if that's the only extent of the prohibition there, a whole bunch of stuff falls out, including officers and directors who are smart enough to not buy the securities of their company, but to buy other securities in other companies that their privilege access gives them to. So that was one huge, huge hole there. Um, so courts, once again, got creative, um, urged on by the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Department of Justice to create the so-called misappropriation theory of insider trading. That, too, turns on a fiduciary relationship, but the fiduciary relationship is not between the parties of the securities transaction. Under the misappropriation theory, the duty runs from the source of the information and the person who is using the corporation's information there. And so another very famous case involving um, this time an attorney. Um, so it's United States versus O'Hagan is the 1987, I, I'm sorry, the 1997 decision um, that endorsed um, and accepted the misappropriation. And there the fraud then is occurring um, to the source of the information. So, oh, five minutes left. I'm glad I got in Phyllis versus Humphrey. Um, so the misappropriation theory certainly covers much of bad behavior in the securities markets, but there are other um, certain holes that even can't be got under the misappropriation theory. For example, any information that is stolen by a pure thief, um, as opposed to a fiduciary thief, so um, is, is not prosecutable under the misappropriation theory um, because the fraud occurs um, not from the buying and selling per se, but the failure to disclose you are using the source's information for personal profit. And the Supreme Court in the United States of Arizona Hagen said that that duty is also triggered by the fiduciary relationship there. Um, so if you uh, go in and steal information from a company, um, you will not be prosecuted under the misappropriation theory. So going back then to this idea that there is a disclosure duty if you wrongfully obtain information, I think that is doctrinally more accurate. Um, I think that it is broader and therefore captures more behavior. And I think it is actually true to the common law as well, which for as long as the United States sticks to interpreting insider trading as only a fraud, then let's get, and so hence my title behind fiduciaries, um, a broader embrace of the common law. Um, I actually don't think that approaching insider trading law through a fraud rubric is actually the way that I would run the railroad. Um, I think that a statutory prohibition um, is the better way. And here we really see history going full circle. Uh, for the last five years or so, there's been pending in the U.S. Congress actually passed by bipartisan House of Representatives a uh, outright prohibition of essentially using wrongfully obtained information in securities transactions. And so that even expands beyond the Philip versus Humphrey fraud idea and makes this just whenever you have uh, whenever you have knowledge or are reckless in not knowing that your information has been wrongfully obtained. Um, you cannot use it in a securities transaction. Um, and so that covers all these, which I haven't really spoken to, the idea of tippy liability, um, which of course is as much of a problem as individuals themselves learning information and trading on it. Tippy liability is derivative. Um, and so what that means is once again, you need the fiduciary relationship of the initial person but in the United States, we have another legal fiction that the tippy inherits the fiduciary duties. And so wrongfully obtained information, a statutory prohibition would eliminate that legal fiction as well. And so um, 
So I think that uh, one one often neglects, even when one is teaching, to remind students that, you know, Justice Powell's seminal opinion in the Chiarella case, talking about rooting disclosure duties in fiduciary duties, that's one way. There's other ways, and those other ways are, you know, still relevant today. So thank you very, very much.